What did you want to be when you were a little girl? Oh, when I was a little girl. Um, I wanted to be a designer and living abroad somehow. <laughs> and then I changed to be a police officer following uh, my dad and my granddad's sort of career. But ended up completely different. What, what kind of a designer did you want to be? Fashion designer. Oh, a fashion designer. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and what made you think you wanted to do that? What influenced you? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear. What what influenced oh, you? Okay. Um, because because the dance behind the you know the the, the curtain in um, Soviet Union time, we ha I had my first Barbie girl I think when I was about twelve. So they were dispatched to us from chucks like sort of you know those with no heads and sort of these foreign bodies, so we were lucky to get it. So we had to improvise with my friends to sort of dress up as Barbie girls. <laughs> so we had to sort of sew a lot of clothes for them. That's, I think, what kind of family oh. my decision at that time. Out of necessity. <laughs> so so where were you born, Yana? Yeah. Where, where were you born? I was born in Ukraine. Oh, I was in... born in Ukraine, but at the time it was still Soviet Union. Uh-huh. And then how did you end up leaving there? How did you leave um, there? Then, yeah, then I was working as a TV journalist. I uh, graduated from university and I was working for five years as a TV presenter. And I met my husband who is British when he was working in Ukraine. Uh, so we moved to Britain and uh, I gave birth to my son. And then I basically, after my first cancer, I decided to... I uh, leave journalism behind and started working in human rights and women's rights. And uh, because I was traveling so much, a lot, a lot of the time around the world, my husband said, let's quit our life in Britain and let's move to the places where you can do more of your work. So he started, um, basically he gave up his business and he started teaching English so I could do more easily what I love to do. So we lived in Sri Lanka and now we're living in the market. Wow, that's really amazing. Very amazing. Yeah. And could you say a little bit about what you're doing then, since you're moving around? What, what you're uh, the, idea was, yeah, the idea was that I would be concentrating on my family's work. And in Sri Lanka it did work because I was doing basically, the way how I work is I do a lot of consultancy for different companies. It could be work with human rights, or so writing reports and research papers. I do a lot of training with police officers, GPs, doctors, um, and sometimes as well I do like a baking workshop. So all that way I earn my money and then I choose which country this year will go and work with women. And in Sri Lanka it's work. But when we moved to Amman, the first week when we arrived here, I was diagnosed with a second cancer. So unfortunately, plans didn't go quite well because I had to go for treatment nearly for a year. And now I'm in remission for a year and three months. So I'm starting getting back to work. So I went, as soon as I finished my chemo, I went to my Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. Also, this year I went to Nepal working with women. And right now I'm concentrating getting back sort of, uh, to work, although it's very, very difficult in the man as a foreigner and in a limited visa. So it's very dangerous for me to pick up any kind of work. So as soon as my mom is kind of picking up again, I'm hoping to go with Autumn to Georgia to work at the refugee camp there. So that's how it's kind of work in Russia. Could you, could you say what your work is that you're doing with women? I advertised as a painting classes um, because it's easier to explain to women. Uh, and when women come to my classes, they usually partner with um, NGOs. Um, and uh, then basically during the first painting class or second class, I start working with them as a human rights activist. So basically doing advocacy work because um, painting is the best tool for us to make them relax and start talking about the experiences. Um, and also, like I said, because not many places, if I would have gone to an advertising as a human rights workshop or an empowerment workshop, that would have been allowed in the country. 
Yes, I understand. I, I was thinking about that because uh, I know once I was working with some migrant women um, who only spoke Spanish and it, there was a lot of violence. Yeah. And so we decided we would create a sewing group and um, mm -hmm. do some other things with food. And then many women came and we were able to talk about things that we had in common. And then we talked about the violence. Yeah. So I know this model very well and yeah. it's quite, quite efficient. Quite efficient. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's correct. Yeah. So, so how do you think that all those things that you thought about as a little girl, being a police officer and a designer, how do you think that's translated into the work you're doing your life today? I think it's working with women. It's working with people. Basically, I've chosen a career in journalism, and I spent twelve years doing that. And I think it's working with people and for people and human rights and women's rights is exactly the same because you can communicate with anyone around the world because we all have uh, human basic human rights, you know. So I think that, again, people, working with people and for people because I'm really a social person. Everywhere around me, within 10 seconds, I make lots of friends and I want to help communities. And I think that that's really baseline. That's a great philosophy. The world would be a much better place if more people could uh, be thinking that way about it. In the Middle East, it's actually quite similar. I'm really amazed how um, helpful, kind, and uh, I don't know, people would go out of their way to help you because when we moved here and I was diagnosed, you know, we didn't know anyone, and the amount of people came to my house to help me with my son. To arrange the medical care and everything, I cannot, you know, so actually it's a lot of misunderstanding by the media, so it's been the best place for us to be at that time. So this part of the world works exactly by this kind of scheme. Yes, yes. Well, when I said that, I should have added a couple of sentences about the fact of this culture in the United States and our impact on the world, that if we could be better here. Oh, the same in the UK. Yeah, the same in the UK, believe me. We've just been back home, both Ukraine and UK, and it's a pooling state in the both of the country. And we're so happy that we're out of it right now. Yeah. We live somewhere where actually people understand what community is. Yes, exactly. So that's uh, that's what's sad, is that we don't understand that in this country. So, so then we influence the rest of the world through our policies, and it's shameful. So, so yeah. enough about my politics. Uh, <laughs> I could get very sad. I could get very sad talking about it because I feel like I, uh, and I think Diane agrees with me, we feel like we're foreigners just waiting to go home. And I, I said, I feel like I'm from Mars, the planet Mars waiting to go home. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, I understand. I'm totally with you on that one. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you think that these dreams you had as a little girl, do you think they impacted what you're doing now? Or do you think it was just being a little girl and you forgot about it? Um, you know, I've been influenced a lot in my childhood by my both grandmothers. And they've both been very social and very sort of the heart of their communities. And I could see how hard life was back at the Soviet Union and how people couldn't really live without support and helping each other. And I think, you know, seeing them both, how much they help people and how many women around them, that's kind of a thing what they got from my childhood. But in terms of jobs, you know, yeah, it's kind of dreams and then you change your dreams because like before I already applied to become a police officer and then the last minute my dad said to me, look, the system is going to eat you, you're crazy person, just to up. So the last day, just before joining the forces, you know, I decided to go and start a journalism. So, but again, you know, it's just being with people and helping people, and that, that's the most important thing for me. And seeing my old grandmothers like that, I think that's really what I took from my childhood and from my country. Do you think there was a defining moment in your life? Yeah, being diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, when I was in Britain with no friends, no family, and understanding that I could die. And my boss was calling me with a deadline from for magazine, 
And I just remember saying to myself, if I'm going to survive, I want to do something for people and I want to change my life. And uh, the next week, my boss backed me because I was ill and the first job also came to work with black minority ethnicity women. And I thought that that's kind of my calling and now we see how it will go and since then. I never look back and I'm so happy with changing jobs, changing careers, changing the calling and passion. And that was the moment lying down in that hospital bed in, in the UK. Do you think there were other times in your life where there was a situation that really defined the next move that you made or is that the major one? I think in terms of uh, like passion and, and everything, I think it was already after I moved uh, from my country because in, again, in the past, in Ukraine, kind of, you know, people are extremely brainwashed, we don't know anything about the world. There are no such thing as doing something for yourself as hobbies and you know. So I think I've only after moving abroad I kind of realized what the world was all about and I started doing and understanding what I want more kind of out of life. So I think for me it was totally when I moved back when I moved to Europe. How do you hope to use what you've learned from these experiences in your dreams as a little girl in your future? Oh, dreams. Um I think seeing people suffering a lot in terms of, you know, some sort of poverty around me and um, people not being able to sort of access the basic basics of their lives, that kind of influenced, I think, uh, that I wanted to help people and I wanted to explain to people, especially women around me, you know, that life is different and you don't have to go through domestic violence and things like that. I think it's definitely again seeing and watching my community and the way people stack and how narrow minded they are back home. I think that's definitely influenced kind of what I wanted to achieve because I wanted to help my family, I wanted to help the village my parents coming from, you know, I wanted to kind of explain to people that, that, that the world is different and, and you could change your life. I think that seeing that kind of suffering around, especially after Chernobyl broke and I think that that definitely influenced that kind of dream, you know, to get out of that myself and help others to sort of train them, to explain to them, to maybe uh, show them with my example. How do you feel um, being in a place where there's a language barrier? Uh, how do you feel that influences your progress? Oh, I have no language problems anywhere in the world do you go to because we all speak language of love, you know, the language of uh, all the people at the end of the day, I go by the formula that all the people around the world want to do the best for their families. And as long as you understand that, you'll be able to communicate with anyone around the world. As long as you're kind and you're showing people that, you know, you true self and you come with no violence, with love to anyone's home, that's kind of, I think, the best formula. So language for me never been a Barry, and no matter where you would send me to tomorrow, I would always have to communicate this kind of aspect, love, kindness, understanding, peace, that's the most important. But yeah, probably my husband who's teaching English, he finds it difficult sometimes to communicate with people from different countries. And I find the right kind of people, they understand me better because, again, being a foreigner and speaking few languages, I understand that you need to communicate a bit more clearly to people who don't speak. Language. Yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, I totally agree with that because that's the challenge, isn't it? But the one thing that you have managed to figure out is how to focus on what you have in common. And that's the other thing that gets you past the language issues. And you've done that with yes. baking. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about the baking part of what you do? Yeah, usually the first minute I come to some sort of room here, usually I'll have somebody from the NGO with whom I'm part and things that to introduce me so people are not scared, they're not, you know, surprised what is going on. And uh, usually I start by talking about my life and why I'm today there, you know, what's the message. And basically the most important you know, thing when you introduce yourself during that time, you explain you that actually lots of people care about you here in the specific center. No matter if you're a survivor of OFGM or domestic violence in India, because people that say do not bring the cake, so they pay me. 
so that I could save the money and come and buy this album for you or this cookbook or stuff like that. So people already being surprised and actually feel cared for. And uh, usually I start explaining to them how they can help me to survive those cancers in terms of mental sort of state. And uh, we start thinking, they simply like follow what I'm showing them, but as a, as a, during the third class, I ask them to sing their traditional songs, because uh, usually I say that the most important ingredient we put in our baking, no matter if it's a cake or a piece of bread, a loaf of bread, it's love. And uh, so we start singing or something like women in or red dancing for the first time after genocide, which happened there. So it was really, really sort of gave me a lot of good time to see that that kind of work can change people's perspective. And uh, then at the end of the class, people usually take what they made for their children. So usually I show them uh, pictures of my son, they can relate to it. And then the next class, I find that people actually come with their recipes. They want to show me what they know, what they learned, or they start talking to you. They want to open up, and you know, they start sharing. So I don't know. <laughs> it's really difficult for me to explain because for me, it's like a simplistic thing which I do. But I don't know. No, it's per it makes perfect sense. Uh, it's a process, and and as, and it's to me when you were saying it, it's like a spiritual process and you're just going yeah. with what is happening around people's energy and just really hearing what people yeah, are right. are communicating with you and not just their words that's what i understand you saying yeah 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 but, but at the end of the class people need to come and ask can we give you a hug you know that oh. pictures and i've got at the moment actually a very famous uh, photographer and documentalist from india She's following me at some of my trips, and she has been taking some amazing pictures. We're hoping to put some books together and showing what the baking therapy can do. So she has been filming me before in India, and she has sort of you know, documented this woman. She herself has been amazing. You know, with the photos that she's been taking, you know, change people, even their posture. They've got some pictures, you know, there with the class and preparing the staff of the class, and it's showing the big difference. That's fantastic, and I love that when you said people come and give ask to give you a hug. That's really sweet. Mm -hmm. How did you decide to go to Oman? Ah, to Oman. Uh, to Oman uh, because we didn't enjoy a life in Sri Lanka, and as soon as my husband's contract finished, we were choosing between countries which offered him jobs. And Oman was so on our list because we visited Oman, and Oman was. A very hospitable, amazing country. And at the time of moving here, one of the universities offered me a job to teach journalism here. Mm. And my son enjoyed um, schools which he did here, so we thought that it would be a good move. But like I said, my wife decided to do this. a different, different plan for us. So. And uh, now, during the time I was treated here, the Sultan of Oman changed the laws in the country for foreigners. It's really impossible to get any job because the organization now is a lot of foreign and leave, but the country itself is one of the best I ever visited. What, what's the last sentence you said? It was hard to hear. Um, I'm oh, sorry, I forgot to say. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, so what I'm just saying that basically we just purely were choosing in terms of uh, the opportunities for our son because he suffered a lot in Sri Lanka in terms of stomach diseases because the food there were not really good and school wasn't good either. So we were basically just choosing purely by culture and you know where we, where we felt that the family would be happy. Hmm. I see. And how old is he? How old is your son? My he's eleven. Oh, eleven. Oh, that's that's hard to be eleven sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's actually influenced a lot by my work. He's uh, already he actually choosing between American University and British University to be a diplomat. He says he wants to make this all the best place. So he's studying five languages. He's very into mom's sort of type of work. So he's a very unique child, not like ordinary eleven years old. 
That's wonderful. I, I am amazed when children have the experiences like your son, because uh, I, I've raised my granddaughter from infancy and uh -huh. she she had similar experiences. And it, it just changes yeah. everything for them, their languages, to speak other languages and to- Cultures. The cultural influences. It yeah. just makes them citizens of the yeah. world. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and it's so much he, better. He used to call himself a third culture kid, but right now he learned that there are apparently a new brand which is called Bridging Kids. It's uh, a kid bridging different cultures and countries. So maybe that young granddaughter could relate to that too. Yes, bridging, I think, yes. <laughs> I think she could. She's trying to bridge in the United States and it drives her crazy. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> She, she's definitely a bridging kid, but she says uh, she will decide to hide. <laughs> but she, 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 she is tw tw she's 25 now, so she's finding her way. Yes. So she, 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 she's, she decided that she would uh, work with uh, animals because animals speak every uh -huh. language. <laughs> and you don't have to worry, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very <really> wise. <laughs> yes. Yes, I think so, too. Um, so we're just, uh, one of the things that we like to hear about are people who have influenced you, because we know that each of the people that we're interviewing, in, and, and ourselves, too, that there have been many people that we have influenced. But then it's interesting to know who, what is the best advice that you have been given in your life and, and ex how did you um, decide to use it? I would say probably the best advice was given to me uh, by one of my doctors 12 years ago, I think, in, back in the UK. Because I had a terrible time with diagnosing some people were facing my condition benign, some were saying it's cancer. And then it turned out to be a very rare disease which were very easily treated and it was only 200 people who diagnosed with that disease. But when I was going through my operation, uh, my doctor, who was a friend of a friend, contacted me and sort of on a friendship basis he told me, I know you had a really bad experience and you're really worried and you're really scared because it's your life and your child is like basically newborn. But he told me, always go to all these kind of things with an open mind. Somebody says it's bad, somebody says it's good, but as long as you have just an open mind, and if it's good, it's good, if it's bad, it's bad, but as long as you sort of take it in your stride and have that open mind and never give up. And that basically, I think, completely changed my life. And since that time, even when I go to some dangerous places to work with women or I face other diagnoses and stuff, uh, usually if I kind of try to calm myself down with that sort of words which he said to me, that usually works and really calm me down. Yes, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So as we're talking, and at the end it was true. Yes, and that's good. Yep. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> as we are talking, I am wondering if you have other things you would like to to say or tell us about your work or your life or what you're thinking at this time in history. I, you know, <laughs> I, sometimes it's easier to go and fight all these awful practices around the world. It's easier for me, tomorrow somebody will allow me to go to Iran, to Afghanistan in terms of union restrictions. I will go without thinking because for me this thing, I'm fearless when I go to these places and I want to help people. But when it comes to human health and health Sort of and do uh, where your therapy is involved, this is when I get the most weakest because for the past now uh, year and a half I've been in a state of really bad health anxiety because of the experiences I have had. And my doctor, my medical team here in Oman, they really surprised because they say you're doing this kind of work and you're not scared, but then you're having a little headache and you're really like worried or it's not the chance again, it's not the that. Sometimes it's really difficult to combine with the work I do, but as soon as I fly to another part of the world and I get with women and we start doing something and helping others, 
This is kind of it, um, shown through the formula by Dalai Lama, who said that, that you know that if you kind of feel that your life is really bad, you take yourself out of this perspective and see yourself compare your problem comparing to the world's problem. And I think that's really kind of been helpful, and that's how I live by this kind of formula. And uh, you know, I wish that Oman would have been a bit more open to the foreigners to work, so I could reach more countries, but. The time that, you know, like they are, hopefully in a couple of months' time, I would have achieved my goal in terms of raising more money and going to work in Jordan. Hopefully, this is going to be our next destination because uh, Oman is a little bit difficult to reach in terms of uh, this budget airline. In terms of the work I can do, it's very restriction. Yes, so hopefully, we'll move to Jordan next year where I could. Absolutely, just face myself at the refugee camps and work there non stop helping women to get more vocational training and advocacy work and sort of put up some mobile and bakeries and help them to you know, move on with their life. So that, that is as it is at the moment. It's a lot and a lot of stress to have to make the decision and to move to another place and re establish yourself. Do you feel like that influences? Yes. Do you, Do you feel like that influences your health? Uh, no, because we still have a year here, and that kind of another year could be watched by my doctors and stuff. No, it's actually not the stress. Nobody could nobody could explain why you know two different cancers like ten years between happened and what influenced. Some people say because you're from Ukraine and it's Chernobyl. Some people say. You're flying probably too much, and but you know, it's life, it's nobody could expect. But again, you know, I fought very aggressive fight for cancer last year uh, when not many people just make it to another side. But I said I would do it, and I did. And again, I go to the hospital, I'm trying to do it with patients because here in the Middle East, we were not allowed to remove the head guard, so doctors are not even telling them the truth. You're going to lose your hair and stuff like that. So I did a lot of campaigns here in terms of all oh, that beautiful and this is what happened and you know, working with cancer associations here because it's a lot of blood sort of circulating diseases here because lots of people marrying as brothers and sisters, so as a result they have lots of blood related diseases in this country. So it's a lot of work to be done, it's no matter where you are, you know, as long as you can help. But sometimes you do ask the questions and you know don't get any answers. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you very much for calling us for your time. Yes. Thank you for your time.